Before people get upset by just seeing the title, I do not dislike Elden Ring at all. As that title says, it's a great game and I played it for a little over 100 hours. It's pretty early still in 2022, but Elden Ring already has to be the favorite for Game of the Year, and its potentially biggest competition in God of War Ragnarok has no release date in sight as of me making this video. There were times where I felt like a little kid again because I couldn't wait to hop back in and explore. Times where I was sitting at my computer getting physically nervous when I noticed I had a tough boss down to a sliver of health. But there were also times where I was shouting words I can't say in the first minute of a YouTube video at my monitor. I've played the three Dark Souls games, but with each title I made it less and less further into them. I won't say they're bad games by any means either, it's really the opposite. I thought they were awesome. But as I played, the scales kept tipping far further to the frustrating side than the fun side. Even though I liked the idea of them, I didn't want to play a video game that kept pissing me off. I'd always hit a point where I just stopped having fun. They were really good games, they just weren't for me personally. With all the hype and praise around Elden Ring, I had to jump back in once again. From Software has certainly found their niche, and most of their fans absolutely love their games. When you hear something called niche, usually that's taken to mean a relatively small group of people when compared to the popular norms. Soulsborne type games never reached complete mainstream status of the GTAs or Call of Duties of the world, but they are extremely successful still. Their niche is a pretty big one, and From Software has essentially created their own genre at this point. Even the black sheep of the series in Dark Souls 2 is still usually seen as a good game on its own merit, just not as good as the rest of their catalog. And that's what I think I wanted most out of Elden Ring. I wanted to feel that same attachment to the game that so many people have. I wanted to feel the same sense of fighting through the difficulty that fans absolutely love. So, going in, I decided I wasn't going to use a guide, I wasn't going to look up where to go, how to level up my character to a specific build, or what gear to get. I was going in blind and trying to get the full experience that fans rave about. Instead of just going shot for shot through the game, I'm going to break this up into more like talking points of both my praise and criticisms. Yeah, you heard that right. As taboo of a subject as not loving every second of Elden Ring can be, there will be criticisms here too. So I need to reiterate this. This is my personal experience with Elden Ring, and yours will probably be much different. Nonetheless, I did really like Elden Ring. Whether it's games, movies, TV shows, whatever. I tend to be way more critical of things I like because, well, I give a shit about them and look way more into them than things I think are average or forgettable. Let's get started, and there will be spoilers here too. First off, I want to talk about the early reviews that came out. Again, both the positive and negative. As I said in the intro, From Software has an extremely loyal fan base, and that's something that really fascinates me about these games. I will be getting into that specifically later on, but for now, let's get into some of those reviews that had me scratching my head and how people reacted to them. I am playing this on PC. I'm usually a console player, so I jacked up some of the captures at the start of the game, because honestly, I didn't know how to get the OBS settings right. I don't have a ton of footage from the early game as a result, but it is what it is. My gameplay from those earlier hours is laughably bad, so no harm, no foul. Anyway, I'm running Elden Ring on an i9 with a 2080 Super and 32 gigs of memory. Not top of the line, but still pretty good. A lot of the negative reviews for Elden Ring I watched or read early on really didn't even critique the actual game or its mechanics at all. They basically raged about it being almost unplayable on PC and even the PS5. I had absolutely no issues running this at its top performance settings with other programs still going on in the background. I actually had to turn my settings down a little because the video editor I use is just a free one and was slowing down significantly trying to keep up with the gameplay edits for this video. There were a ton of complaints about frame rate or stuttering problems on PC and I've barely experienced any. The ones that did show up here and there were pretty minor, there and gone in a second and nothing to complain about. I will say though, dragon fights seemed to glitch out somewhat regularly, which was definitely annoying, but nothing game breaking. Other than that, the game works and it works a hell of a lot better than most major titles do at release, which is something that we can't always say anymore. According to some of those negative reviews, you'd think this game was on the cyberpunk or initial No Man's Sky level of bad. I didn't get any of that. I even had this running off my old SATA hard drive by accident and not my SSD, and there were still no issues there with crashes, slowdowns, or load times. For everything that this game has running simultaneously, it's pretty amazing that it loads up and runs in a matter of seconds. 
Only thing that stood out to me was the lack of any attempt to make the characters' mouths sync up with what they were saying. It usually looked like PS2 levels of mouths just opening and closing randomly. I can't speak for everyone, but for my time playing it, there's not much of anything negative I can say about this game from a performance or graphical standpoint. I'm sure some people genuinely did have issues running it, but myself and my friends had no problems playing it across different platforms and different computer builds. I bring this up because I feel like it was people making excuses as to why they didn't like the game, instead of just saying that they didn't like it. If someone doesn't like it, that's fine, it's their opinion. These type of games definitely aren't for everyone. I feel like too many people bought into the hype and didn't get the game they were expecting. Fans of the Dark Souls series, Sekiro, and Bloodborne know who From Software is and what kind of games they make. I don't think it's a stretch to say most casual gamers or people who didn't play Dark Souls have no clue who From Software is as a developer. Once it got closer to release, we did hear about how it was much more forgiving and more accessible than the other From Software games, which put some people's minds at ease when they did make the Elden Ring Dark Souls connection. I feel like a lot of people who complained about Elden Ring were expecting something more along the lines of an Elder Scrolls type game. George R. R. Martin getting writing credits further back to this false sense of security a little bit, seeing as how most people believe the story of Dark Souls is, just go kill what's in front of you. If Elden Ring was going to follow suit, why would they recruit one of the most popular authors in America for that? Well this turned into a rude awakening for a lot of people. A more forgiving and more accessible From Software game is still a From Software game. It's still going to be pretty damn hard most of the time. I feel like the majority of people who immediately bashed the game and said it sucked were just people who didn't get what they were expecting, but didn't want to admit that or that the game was too hard for them. When I bought this, I knew there was a good chance I might not get my money's worth, but I feel like a lot of people didn't have that same thinking. Elden Ring isn't like anything else I've ever played from a learning curve standpoint, including the Dark Souls series. Those gave you plenty of freedom, but still kind of funneled you where you needed to go. They gave you weak enemies to dick around with, or early bosses that made you think, God damn, I need to fight that already? But then found out they were very beatable with some trial and error. They just looked scary. Not Elden Ring. It's on you to get better, and it's on you to push through those frustrations. Some modern games literally have hours worth of exposition and tutorials, so there are a lot of new players that are just not ready for a game like this. You don't get level scaled enemies right out of the gate to learn the controls on, or in-depth tutorials on the combat. You're kinda on your own. Hell, to get a quick combat tutorial, you need to jump into a pit that it seems like most people have no clue is even there from the beginning. For some people, this is a very fun and rewarding system, and I get that. On the other side of the coin, there's a lot of people who just aren't going to have fun with this game because of the frustration, and I get that too. I was one of those people with the Dark Souls series. Just like the other Soulsborne style games, Elden Ring is not a game for everyone despite the massive hype surrounding it. 2020 saw a huge list of highly anticipated games be released. We got the Final Fantasy VII Remake, Ghost of Tsushima, The Last of Us 2, Cyberpunk, Animal Crossing, Doom Eternal, and Warzone just to name a few. Because of the pandemic, we had a pretty lackluster 2021 in terms of big titles. Outside of maybe Horizon Forbidden West, Elden Ring has been the most anticipated game since Cyberpunk at the end of 2020. A lot of people were looking forward to this game and didn't get what they thought they were buying. I believe that the shock of not getting what they were expecting and basically flushing 60 to 70 bucks down the toilet was what made some people so angry during the game's release and the attempted early review bombs. There is another side to this though. Despite the argument I just made against the negative reviews and some people not giving the game a fair chance, Elden Ring is not a 100% perfect game either though, even though I do believe it's probably going to be the game of the year. If there is a game that was 100% perfect, I haven't played it yet. Since I've been a kid, the original Final Fantasy VII has been my favorite game, and god knows there are a million things I can criticize about that one. Not even talking about things that didn't age well, but just things that are fundamentally bad about the game for any time frame since its release. I don't have this little section to sugarcoat anything for people that do believe Elden Ring is perfect. A lot of the reason I'm making this little PSA is because I don't think a lot of the early reviewers beat this game or even got too close to the end of the game. 
The last couple years, we've seen plenty of stories come out with gaming publications and YouTube reviewers afraid to give negative reviews or even simply point out flaws in a good game for fear of losing pre-release copies, not getting their content out quickly enough, or just the fan backlash and dislikes that come along with it. I think Elden Ring can be included in that. A lot of the early, full game reviews were way more vague and revealed less than people who reviewed the beta copies that were released like three months before the full game. Hell, a ton of reviews for the full game had people acting like they never found a cave or a secret in an open world game before. Elden Ring's open world is fantastic, but let's not pretend like that kind of stuff isn't status quo for an open world and hasn't been implemented in games since the 90s. They praise the game for putting dungeons in the open world, but fail to mention how that boss of the same dungeon will get reused three times later on in the game when they run out of enemies. I felt this was most obvious with Leonine Misbegotten fight in Castle Morn. I saw more than a couple reviews that singled him out and said how it was one of the best boss fights, but pretended like the Misbegotten Warrior doesn't show up as a duo boss and eventually a common enemy, making him feel much less unique in the long run. They'd point out how many war ashes and weapons are in the game, but neglect to say how you're never going to use two-thirds of them. I could list a lot more, but you get the idea. You can't tell me the bulk of reviews really couldn't find anything at all they thought was frustrating or a flaw in the game. You can wish certain aspects were different and still give the game a 10 out of 10. I just feel like a lot of YouTubers and publications caved into pressure and gave the game these masterpiece ratings regardless of what they really thought while hiding behind the we don't want to spoil anything mantra as a get out of jail free card from irrational viewers getting upset about the slightest knock on the game while ignoring the rest of an otherwise fantastic overall review. I don't know, stuff like that just kind of bugs me and seems a little disingenuous. Anyone who's watched my stuff knows I can get nitpicky on weird things, and I'm sure that's all this is, uh, but whatever. It's my channel, and I wanted to touch on it real quick. So, that's my thoughts on the positive and negative sides of the early reviews. I feel like they're both a little full of shit. Everything was either this game sucks or this game is absolutely perfect, without either side really explaining why. Now that the game has been out for about two months, I feel like the quality of analysis containing both praise and criticism is way better. Why is that? Because people have actually played the game and had time to make well thought out discussions. With that rant out of the way, moving on. To me, this didn't feel like a standalone game or different series. It felt like Dark Souls 4. If that's what they titled it instead of Elden Ring, no one would bat an eye. Hell, George R. R. Martin has even called this a sequel when talking about the game. Now that's not a bad thing though. From Software clearly has found a big fan base that loves this style. It's the if it ain't broke, don't fix it cliche here. It's not like they didn't add anything, but at the heart of it, this is a Dark Souls game with an open world. An open world that's pretty damn fun to explore, but we can't ignore the similarities between the Dark Souls series and Elden Ring. Lost Grace Spots and Runes are just a different way of saying bonfires and souls. Instead of being the chosen undead, you're Melina's chosen tarnished. The characters and lore are different, but the basic plot remains relatively unchanged as well. Defeat these great lords that are fighting for power, win the power for yourself, then either try to restore balance or mess everything up depending on your ending. Even the combat and menu screens remain mostly unchanged despite the new additions. I don't mean this as a negative, plenty of games do this exact same thing though. Sports games barely change anything other than the roster year to year, Call of Duty games have been accused of essentially being reskins for prior titles, and Resident Evil 6 was seen as a worse, more incoherent version of Resident Evil 5, which was already seen as a worse, somehow more over the top version of Resident Evil 4, yet people still line up to eagerly give away their money. Now, Elden Ring is certainly not in that class because Elden Ring is really good, and what they added felt like natural progression to the Dark Souls series. While it's obviously years away, I do believe that From Software will have to start changing some things up in the next iteration, whether it's called either Elden Ring 2 or Dark Souls 4 though. While everyone is still riding the high of Elden Ring, I get a bad feeling that if the next game continues to piggyback off these same tried and true cliches, fans could quickly start to lose interest, and they won't notice it until they straight up lose interest in the middle of the next game. But you never know. People don't play these games because they want something completely new. 
They play them because they want more of what they like, and From Software certainly knows how to deliver what their fans like. This is an issue that might not arise for quite a while though, and that's because Elden Ring has brought in a massive new wave of fans, as opposed to just the niche players and loyalists. When From Software said this was a much more accessible and forgiving game, they weren't lying. Grace points are very generously placed, and other checkpoints in the form of Stakes of America are all over the map too. It's pretty rare that you're running a gauntlet trying to get back to your lost souls. This was one of my biggest frustrations with their past games. If I was at a point in my life where I didn't have a ton of spare time to play video games, I absolutely hated losing progress. I didn't look at it as, oh well, I got better from the time I played. I looked at it as, I just lost 45 minutes worth of progress that I really don't fucking feel like doing again. This also stands true for the majority of fog doors. It's pretty rare that you'll encounter enemies while running from a Grace or a Stake of America back to a boss fight. The only one I can think of off the top of my head that was a little bit of a pain was dodging a couple banished knights on the way to the Godskin duo. Part of that problem was also them putting in a fog door that you can't go through. Uh, like, why have it there if you can't use it? Just put a regular wall up that then forces me further down the hall. One major problem I do have though is in instances like that where you are forced to run past enemies to get to a fog door, those same enemies can still attack you through the fog. It seems like a pretty big oversight when you barely get into the boss room and something is already attacking you from behind the second your walkthrough animation is over. This happened to me a few times with the Godskin duo and with the Tree Guardian guys before Godfrey's first fight. This can also work against you with summons. If you cast your summon too close to the door, which you'll probably do because right in the beginning of the fight is the easiest spot to do so, there's a huge chance your summon will just turn around and get stuck attacking what's on the other side of the fog door instead of helping you against that boss. Other than that, spear dashes do make the game significantly easier. I don't remember really using them for anything other than boss fights, but they made those boss fights much more manageable. A few of these summons can all but beat bosses one on one once leveled up a bit. Once I stumbled upon the Mimic tier, I knew I never needed to use a different summon all game. I didn't find it until after it had already been nerfed, but even still, my Mimic tier was way better at the game than I was. Before the nerf, I wouldn't be surprised if a fully leveled up Mimic could defeat the majority of the bosses without the player's help. War Ashes can make all the difference between a somewhat comfortable victory and a decisive defeat. I should have played around with more, but I really took a liking to Poison early on and then spent most of the game using Bleed. I wasn't ever changing it once I realized you can deal massive chunks of damage in no time. I do feel like the game would have been better with less War Ashes though. Most of the ones I got, I didn't even bother to check out and it made finding them seem pretty anticlimactic. Honestly, if it wasn't for all the things I just mentioned making Elden Ring more accessible, I probably would have put the game down just like I did with the Dark Souls series and said, well, shit, another time this game's just not for me. Next thing I want to get into is the controls. They almost work too well here. Attacks and dodges kinda queue up and at times can make it feel like there's a big button lag, but it's really just performing the moves that the player inputs. You will be punished for button mashing and I struggled with this big time throughout the whole game. If you're attacking and hit the button too many times, you're going to finish that last attack. Say you want two normal swings. You better only hit that button twice because 9 out of 10 times, you're going to do that third swing if you button mash. If you attempt a power attack, you're going to attempt a power attack. If you realize that was a bad move during the animation, oh well, there's no canceling it out, you're all in. Because of this, I found myself shying away from the slower weapons. With the majority of enemies being able to string together fast, multi-hit combos, attacking one too many times paired with the slow attack animation could really ruin your fight. This does work the same with dodging too. If you panic and hit dodge a couple times when you only needed to do it once, doesn't matter. You're still taking that second roll and missed your chance to sneak in for a hit on an open enemy. A lot of the enemies, and especially the bosses, have the smallest pauses between attacks to further punish you for trying to spam dodge roll as an easy way out of danger. It is what it is, that's Elden Ring's combat. If any of those things I just described happened, it was my fault. You need to be precise with your moves on offense and defense or it'll bite you in the ass. 
I had to break a huge habit of playing Elden Ring like a hack and slash and get accustomed to playing it more like the way it's meant to be played. In the last year or two, the most comparable games I played were Nier Automata, Final Fantasy VII Remake, and God of War. While those games had tough spots, they never felt overly difficult. I had times with Elden Ring where I just felt like I was never going to be good enough at this game without treating it like a part-time job instead of a video game that I'm playing for fun. Especially towards the end when there seemed to be a huge level spike. But that's not how you play this game. If you button mash or miss the timing of your actions, you're going to pay for it. That's the point and what a lot of people see is the charm. There's a reason the get good meme spawned. You need to get good at these type of games and play them the way they were meant to be played. While the combat is certainly punishing, it is very fair most of the time. Your character usually does exactly what you tell them to do. One area that seemed a little hit and miss at times though was with heavy jump attacks. This wasn't something that happened all the time, but even with target lock on, there will be instances where your jump attack just flat out misses an enemy that's not moving if you aren't lined up perfectly. The platforming also felt much more smooth compared to what I remembered from my time playing the Dark Souls games. This isn't saying a whole lot though. Elden Ring is still an action RPG first and not a platformer. As a result, the platforming can still be pretty frustrating at times, even if it's an improvement over prior titles. Jumps sometimes feel more like a leap of faith than an accurate move, and it's hard to gauge when your character will actually decide to drop straight down off a ledge, or go flying like you got a running start even though you tiptoed the whole way. I don't want to see the platforming reduced to scripted climbing or jumping in predetermined spots that we see in games like God of War, Uncharted, and Ghost of Tsushima, but I feel like there has to be a happy medium somewhere that can improve the platforming in Elden Ring. A lot of it just doesn't feel like a modern game. While it's definitely an upgrade, it still feels somewhat stunted and clunky at times. Also, the fall damage seems completely random. I know there's videos and articles out there saying it isn't, but it sure as hell didn't feel that way. During my time playing, fall damage felt extremely inconsistent and more based around level design than consistent height causing damage. It seems more like if you need to drop into an area, you're fine. If you do it in the open world, who knows. I very rarely took damage and lived too. I was either completely fine or died immediately. This was happening just as much in the endgame too when I had a much higher health pool. The lock on system, it really sucks sometimes. It's not completely broken, but it's not uncommon to lag or disregard an enemy that's right in front of you. Groups of enemies specifically can be troublesome for it. This isn't something that doesn't work like 50% of the time by any means, but when it does happen, it feels unfair. Because of this, it feels like it happens way more often than it really does. It's human nature, you aren't going to remember the last 25 times that it worked, but you will sure as hell remember those couple times you got completely turned around and took cheap hits when it didn't. Personally, I liked having it on way more often than not, but it's far from a perfect mechanic. I had a whole section lined up with examples of it messing up in different situations, but I feel like it's pretty general knowledge that it's flawed, so I'll cut that section short. Let's get into the meat of the game though. The main attraction of From Software games is the exploration, discovery, and bosses. These are things that Elden Ring mostly knocks it out of the park with. The open world is pretty great. For most of the game. The world never feels empty and background objects are very smartly placed. Landmarks, castles, towers, and interesting locations are always within view even when you're still a pretty good ways away. Basically if you can see it, you can go there. This is done by making a lot of the middle areas in each location on somewhat level ground or lower than its outer surroundings. You always have something to catch your eye and think, what the hell is that? Now let's go check it out. If you know where to go on subsequent playthroughs or really just look hard enough in the beginning, about three quarters of the game is accessible to the player right from the start. Along the way you'll find bosses just hanging out in the open world, teleporters, dungeons, new loot, and even an entire underground map to go along with the different landscapes. For me though, the open world is at its best in the first half to two thirds of the game. You're given so much freedom and different experiences right off the bat that the game feels like it starts to run out of steam towards the end. 
When the first dragon in Limgrave flies in, it's an awesome moment that literally made me jump, say oh shit out loud, and run for my life. When I got to the Snowlands, I ran across a large open area of a frozen lake and immediately thought, well, I guess I'm going to fight another dragon here, and that's exactly what happened. It just doesn't have the same impact behind it. Fighting the Tree Sentinel in Limgrave feels unique and something that I couldn't wait to come back and beat once I got better at the game. Fighting two of them in Lindell just kind of made me think, damn it, him again, and now there's two. It's also kind of poorly timed because there's a Draconic Tree Sentinel right around the corner from them. Why not just take them out and utilize the Draconic variety? I feel like the game struggles at times to maintain the level of excitement and keeping things feeling fresh in its later hours. Fighting the same dogs, bats, wolves, foot soldiers, rats, and imps feels more frustrating than fun when the game just decides to give them more health and higher attack power later. Enemies you should be swatting like flies are now becoming threats for no reason other than the area they're in. This gives the player a sense of reverse progression. Your character is 5 times the level and your personal skill has gotten better over 60 hours of gameplay, but a sneak attack from an early game enemy hits damn near as hard as a boss because the game gave them a random Dragon Ball Z style power boost out of nowhere. I'm fine with repeat enemies like the Erd Tree avatars because they're supposed to be at the minor Erd Trees and that's where they show up. They could have switched up their attacks a little bit more to make them feel more unique, but it's not like you get to the end of a mining tunnel and fight one. Or at least that I found. Ulcerated Tree Spirits, however, are in the bottom of dungeons, but sometimes literally fall out of the sky for no reason. Like, that's the kind of reused asset that bothers me. They already have, like, five different kinds of wolves. Why not make one kind specific to Limgrave and Weeping Peninsula, one to Ironia, one to Atlas Plateau, and so on? It would make that same very common enemy feel more specific to each region, and less like something they just threw in to fill space. I was also really disappointed to see the crazy birds and two-legged dogs from Kaelid in the snowfields. Kaelid is so much different than the rest of the map, and those felt very specific to that region. You already have the white versions of the two-legged dogs there. Why not just take those out of Kaelid and put them in the snowfields? Hell, that's exactly what they did with trolls when they gave them more of a yeti appearance. For as much of a pain in the ass as Kaelid can be, it's a fantastic area that tells a story through just its visuals and somehow made a soundtrack of buzzing flies seem tense, scary, and fitting. Things like seeing new enemies there that have distinct features of that region made it awesome and made it stand out compared to the rest of the world. I felt like these were monsters exclusive to the Kaelid region. Until you see them again later on and it makes them feel substantially less unique for where their original variants came from. I feel like the Godskin duo is the perfect example of a poorly reused boss. Unless you really aren't exploring, there's a very good chance you've fought these two individually at least once, if not multiple times already. So to fight them yet again and tougher than ever for no reason other than you're in a late game area, it makes the fight feel annoying rather than challenging. If the Faramazula fight was your first encounter with these enemies, I feel like it wouldn't be a fight that seems to be widely regarded as one of the worst in the game. At least those two have something in common though. Fights like the copy and paste of the Castle Morn boss paired with a Crucible Knight make no sense. It gives a strong sense of lazy design and the developers just threw them together for the sake of throwing two random bosses together. Dragons can also get pretty tiresome. Except for a couple of them, it's the same fight each time except they change what elemental damage the dragon uses. In my experience, there's also a 50-50 chance the dragon will just fly off and disappear like halfway through the fight or clip through the ground. The counter argument I keep seeing is, well, From Software reuses assets all the time, what's the problem? The problem is that I'm not a massive Dark Souls fan, so I don't have prior fond memories to fall back on that make me not care. This is a personal opinion about one single game. From Software's history of reused assets isn't an excuse for a game flaw. It just means that you've been ignoring that flaw for a decade because you liked the games. I think it really comes down to variation. Elden Ring is massive and I just kinda got the feeling of been there done that by the end. The early to mid game surprises didn't extend through the entire game for me regardless of some awesome locations along the way. Story bosses might be visually different, but at times they all just felt the same. In some instances, they were. You have Margit and Morgoth with slight changes. You fight Godric again in an Everjail. Mog Lord of Blood is just a tougher version of Mog the Omen. 
you get the Beast Clergyman attack and Malachus first form. The Shade version of Godfrey and Godfrey's first phase before he turns into Whirlu. People act like it's just the mini-bosses and common enemies that get reused, and that just isn't the case at all. This isn't like reusing a Stalker-type boss or fighting the same character multiple times because it makes sense to a game's story. This is just straight up reusing main bosses because they had to fill the world. You need to fill it with items too for each combat preference. While it sounds great on paper, it made the majority of the loot and rewards I was getting completely irrelevant to my playthrough, which eventually led to me not caring about exploring as much by the end. I can't see myself starting a new playthrough or a new game plus. For a game so massive, it's kind of ironic because it didn't feel like there was enough variance or substance by the end. I just hit a massive wall with doing the same things over and over for so long. On the surface, there's a ton of different ways to approach combat, but think about it. Is there really that much of a difference between each weapon? Once you pick your weapon type, the War Ash is really what determines its value to the player instead of the actual weapon. I'm well aware that they have different stats, but once you level them up, is it really that noticeable? For me, this just came to a screeching halt due to the length of the game. I wanted something different, and Elden Ring is somewhat of a one-trick pony. Explore for a bit and then fight something difficult by dodging around and waiting for an opening. Once you've had your fill of that, there isn't a whole lot left. You can spin that and make the same claim for almost any game, but there has to be something else to really hold my attention than just simply exploring and attacking repeat enemies the same way that I have been all game. Again, except for the War Ashes, combat really isn't any different from the first hour of the game to the hundredth hour. It all depends on what each individual player is looking for in an open world experience. If you're just looking to explore, go to a new location and think, god damn that visual is awesome, slash at an enemy and move on, then Elden Ring is probably one of the best open world games you've ever played, and compares to or surpasses your initial experience with other generational titles like Breath of the Wild or Skyrim. For me, that open world just got a little dull. Yes, the scenery is gorgeous, but I want something fun to do when I get there besides fighting the same enemies the same way every time. Some of these next comparisons might not be fair because Elden Ring is essentially its own genre, but let's compare it to some other open world games nonetheless. First up, let's look at Metal Gear Solid 5. You can approach the combat and enemy zones in so many different ways. You can run and gun, or you can stealth it, and both are viable options that will result in different experiences. The majority of locations also have different entry points to switch up how the encounter plays out. And yes, Elden Ring has stealth, but it's very bare bones. Except for getting a backstab on an unaware enemy or sneaking by instead of running by, that's about as deep as it gets. Elden Ring's weapon choice is dominated by its War Ash, and the only difference other than that is faster attack and less damage, or slower attack and heavier damage. Metal Gear 5 gives you the wide array of different interchangeable guns that any third-person shooter does, along with different ways and items to mess around and have fun with its enemies in the process. Now, I know these are two extremely different game types, but that variation helps keep it fresh. I can go in with a tranquilizer gun or a rocket launcher, and both are viable choices that have positives and negatives. You also have to decide whether you want to airlift out soldiers and material, but risk setting off an alarm for all the other soldiers in the area. In Elden Ring, you pretty much have two choices in every scenario. Either fight what's in front of you, or run past, and 99% of the time the enemy gives up in 5 seconds when you turn a corner. Where Torrent stays exactly the same throughout the entire game and has no upgrades or changes, Metal Gear Solid 5 lets you pick between your horse, dog, quiet, or mobile armor to go out into the open world with, and each has multiple upgrades and options throughout the game. The hub world of Mother Base is significantly more fleshed out and time consuming than the Round Table Hold is too. Not to mention that there's the typical ridiculous Metal Gear plot going on the whole time to help keep you engaged. Something like Metal Gear 5 had me wondering, how do I want to play the game, with Elden Ring just having me think, where do I feel like wandering around? I criticized Red Dead Redemption 2 a ton for not being able to decide whether it wants to tell a linear story or be an open world game, but that open world feels much more alive than Elden Ring's. The game can double as a legit hunting simulator on top of the entire regular game. While the main missions suffer from requiring too much control, I feel like they did questing much better than Elden Ring. 
You can search for dinosaur bones, cigarette cards, legendary animals, and find a serial killer among other things that you'd just stumble upon in the open world without having the dreaded yellow mission markers telling you exactly where to go and what to do. Elden Ring has no shift in tone the entire game, so that also doesn't let it throw in some of the quirky side content like UFOs, time travelers, or finding a robot that Red Dead 2 can implement. Arthur finding what's been left behind by the serial killer's trail of bodies is way more unique than any similar situation in Elden Ring. There's no extra effort or trying to make something look special. They just put the character model on the floor and throw blood around it. It comes off as kinda lazy and outdated. Red Dead's version of side questing and searching for the items related to those quests is way better than needing to Google where some random NPC will be that just keeps saying cryptic things until they either attack you or die and usually you're left very confused as to why either outcome even happened. Hell, Skyrim 11 years ago had a better crafting system because you couldn't just find a random book and then make whatever you wanted, wherever you wanted. You had to level up skills and use certain devices to make the things you needed without holding an infinite number of materials, weapons, and armors. What's the point of giving us an anvil in the beginning of the game to use for upgrading weapons if we're never going to use that feature again outside of that very early game location? I could give more examples, but you get the idea. Elden Ring is what Elden Ring is. Once I opened up the whole map, I had a huge drop off in my enjoyment. The world is beautiful, but there's no substance behind it once you realize you've seen everything it has to offer. It's just, go here. Oh, that looks cool. I guess I'll fight the same thing I've been fighting all game now. Hope that I give a shit about the item I get. Oh, it's a charm that increases robustness. Cool, never using that. That's going to lead me into my next topic, and that's the community around the game. I've rewritten this part so many times that I've scrapped entire scripts about whether to even include this or not, but fuck it, I want to talk about it. For years, I've always heard about how the Dark Souls series had the best gamer community in the world, that it was everyone versus the game, and there was about as little negativity as possible surrounding the fandom. I have seen so much of the opposite surrounding Elden Ring at times. This is the best way I can put into words what I'm talking about. Get Good started as a light-hearted inside joke among the Dark Souls community. With Elden Ring, that has turned into a serious, real mindset of some fans. Originally, Get Good was a way for the fans to say, keep it up, tough through, and you'll improve. You'll get good, you'll progress, and you'll feel good for doing so. This is where you see the flood of comments, videos, and articles of people talking about why Dark Souls is so important to them. How it gave them confidence and in some cases even genuinely helped their mental state because the game felt like it gave them something difficult they could control and overcome when things in their waking life seemed out of their control. Now, I'm not being sarcastic here at all. That's fucking awesome for people who feel that way. Anything in the world that can lift people up without being destructive is a good thing 100% of the time. This kind of shared attachment to the games that so many people have was a huge appeal of playing Elden Ring for me. This is not directed at those people. But with Elden Ring, we're starting to see those feelings turn in the opposite direction. Instead of fans feeling united about getting through those hardships together, there's a very vocal group of fans that seemingly don't like Elden Ring becoming mainstream. They don't like people saying it needs an easy mode. They don't like people saying it's not a game for them. They don't like people using spirit ashes. They don't like bleed builds dominating. They don't like how magic can take away difficulty. They don't like people cheesing bosses. They don't like seeing anything except 10 out of 10 masterpiece ratings. They don't like the PvP because they're build lost. Like, come on, guys. They're taking anything from criticisms of the game to even just other people playing it in a different way than they did as a personal attack against themselves. I hate to say it, but I kinda get it, even though it's the worst way possible of going about it. I don't think the ends justify the means, but I kinda get it. With Elden Ring being so successful, they're afraid that things like this could continue to turn from software games in a different direction. That's life, man. But if they do really change up the future games or make them easier, that doesn't change how you play their current catalog. It doesn't erase Dark Souls 1 or Bloodborne from history. They aren't going to release a patch seven years later making those games different. In the beginning of this video, I mentioned how the original Final Fantasy VII was my favorite game. Well, I watched hot garbage like Dirge of Cerberus come out, and then saw them turn Cloud into a moody, emo-style character through Advent Children and Kingdom Hearts, when that's not who his character is in his actual game. 
the remake has made some pretty huge changes that will probably either be awesome or completely ruin the remake story. You know what that doesn't change? The original game that I'm attached to. A lot of these same people get frustrated when Elden Ring is called Dark Souls 4, but be happy that it's Elden Ring and not Dark Souls 4 then. This means Elden Ring can be its own thing if they do decide to keep making it more accessible, and then they can still come out with a legit Dark Souls 4 that's more along the lines of the earlier From Software games. Yes, I called Elden Ring Dark Souls 4 in the beginning, but for now, it kinda is. Whatever the next game From Software comes out with in a few years is going to determine where each franchise goes from here. You just need to wait it out and trust they'll make the right move rather than freaking out on the internet. What makes a game fun is very subjective. The reasons you love a game, another player might not, and Elden Ring gives the player a ton of freedom to make the game fun for different types of people. For me, I hit a massive difficulty spike around Lindell and definitely in the mountaintops of the Giants. In the beginning, I had so much trouble with Margit that I was very overleveled after I finally got past him. Open world and dungeon bosses weren't giving me any trouble, I would have beaten Godric on my first try if I didn't roll off a cliff when he had like two hits left, beat Renala on my second try, and Radon took me like six or seven. The only problem was, I wasn't good at the game even though it felt easier. I gained a ton of levels from using golden runes and selling crafting materials that I found while simply riding around. I realized how strong Bleed was, so I started using that exclusively for extra damage. Once the game's difficulty caught back up to me, I stopped having as much fun. Grinding for levels became tiresome, and the levels I was grinding out really felt like it didn't matter a whole lot to how easily I was now getting killed by everything. I wasn't playing with a guide because I wanted to get the full experience, so I was also doing a lot of this pretty aimlessly. I was being reminded of why I always grew tired of the Dark Souls games. Couple that with the repeat enemies that I spoke about, and I felt like I just wasn't progressing anymore in the game, despite putting in more and more hours. It just wasn't as much fun as the first half of the game was. So I could either stop playing altogether, or start using guides, and looking stuff up seemed like the very easy solution. Now I knew exactly where to get more smithing stones and glow fort. I knew the best places to get gear, and I found the Mogwin's Palace Rune Cheese, all the while not looking past where I was in the story to still not ruin anything I hadn't seen yet. Again, what's better? Not playing the game at all, or shooting a bird while dinner was in the oven? Well, you're goddamn right I shot that bird for an hour straight, and my meatloaf and mashed potatoes were delicious. You know what happened afterwards? I felt like playing the game again, and that's all that matters. Was I playing it the way that it was meant to be played? Yes, I kinda was because I was playing it the way that I found to be the most fun by using methods that are in the game. Newsflash, that spot where you shoot the bird was also jam-fucking-packed with other players' shadows, so I sure as hell wasn't the only person taking advantage of it. If From Software felt so strongly about people quote-unquote not playing the game right, removing that one single bird would have been in the first patch they put out. I just get the impression that some fans getting so mad about things like this are the people who held on to a fallacy that beating a Souls game was some form of life accomplishment. Being upset that it's taking away some fake gamer clout that they always held on to because now millions of people are beating the same games that were once considered a badge of honor. I just can't relate to that. My self-worth isn't tied to how well my thumbs and index fingers react to fast bosses. What matters is that I had fun playing the game, and that's also what matters to the majority of people but we're seeing these pocket groups be extremely vocal about the game not being played the way they want, and it's just ridiculous and self-aggrandizing in my opinion. You play video games for some sense of Ron Swanson type accomplishment? Cool, you do you. Doesn't mean everyone else has to as well. It's a good feeling. Sense of accomplishment and pride. Damn it, I just love it so much. Are you okay? I don't get that same feeling, I just can't relate to it. I wanted to share in that sense of accomplishment that fans love, but Elden Ring just reinforced that's not how my brain operates. The only time I think I felt accomplishment from a video game was being a little kid and finally catching a Taurus to have all 150 Pokemon. If I die to an enemy 20 times in a row, I don't feel accomplished afterwards. I think, thank god that's finally done and I can keep playing the game. 
I want to have fun, and bashing my head against the wall over and over in the same spot isn't fun for me. I'm all about discussing the merits and weaknesses of games, movies, and everything of the sort, because I think it's interesting to hear how everyone interprets things differently, but some of these people need to relax a little bit. If you're unhappy with Elden Ring or think the new players are ruining it, then go play Dark Souls again and be happy. If you're someone on the opposite side that says you now don't like Elden Ring because of some of the fan base, well, you can go do the same. Don't play Elden Ring and go play whatever else you like. I don't know, things like this and how people overreact to video games, it's just kind of fascinating for me. Let's get back to the game though. Before that, I was talking about the open world, and now I want to dial it back a little bit and talk about the legacy dungeons. Except for the tunnels underneath Lindell, I really enjoyed them all, and they're probably the strongest points of the game. This is where veterans of From Software games will feel the most at home. Each dungeon is full of traps, shortcuts, illusionary walls, secrets, and really just a ton of content jam-packed into areas that are never as closed in as they seem. A lot of people don't like the number of gray spots or stakes of America, but for me, this was a welcome change. Each legacy dungeon really feels unique, which is why I think the repeat enemies that pop in bothered me as much as it did. Faramazul is a great example of this. The whole area raises more questions than it gives answers. Why is it crumbling? Did it just start crumbling or have these monsters lived next to tornadoes for centuries? How is it just floating there? Why are there so many dragons, and are dragons now important to the game instead of just enemies? All the prior locations and legacy dungeons are pretty self-explanatory. Faramazula is just like, what the hell is going on? After I finished the dungeon, I looked some stuff up, and the consensus theory seems to be that one of the dragons there, whose name I'm not even going to try and pronounce, was essentially what an Elden Lord would have been before the ring was created, but his god or greater will equivalent abandoned them. As a result, he stuck waiting around and hoping for a return to glory, which in turn started to destroy Faramazula as that used to be his seat as ruler. Somehow or another, this is also frozen Faramazula in time. Take all that with a huge grain of salt though, as it seems like the majority of this is just fan theories, and a lot of people were also arguing against it from what I saw. Anyway, I didn't really care if I didn't know everything about Faramazula, because it was new, it looked cool, and it was fun. Except for the Godskin duo. Since the storyline of Elden Ring isn't heavily tied into the gameplay, I didn't really care if I had no clue what was going on. I was just worried about having fun. Behind all the legacy dungeons are their respective boss and their great rune. Instead of getting into each boss individually, I want to focus on two. Radon and the Fire Giant. For me, Radon was one of the most fun bosses despite the difficulty. He also has some great lore behind him. So if I have this right, he fought Melania to a draw, even though it kinda seems like he won. Both were heavily injured, and Melania kinda rage quit and caused all the Scarlet Rot in Kaelid because she couldn't beat him. He's also a master of gravity magic and literally holds the stars in place. He started learning gravity magic because he became too big to ride his horse that he loved. If he could control gravity magic, he could make himself essentially weightless and continue to ride his horse, which also became a necessity as the Scarlet Rot appears to have taken parts of his feet. If you look closely at some of his moves, he even pushes his horse out of the way to shield it from some of his own attacks. Oh yeah, that Scarlet Rot that started to take his feet? Well, it was also causing him to lose his mind, too. He was doing all of this while still literally fighting to keep his own sanity. His fight felt different than the other story bosses, too. Yes, he's another high-powered combo machine, but you can summon in a bunch of meat shields and have a massive area to fight, which gives it a different feel. Watching Patches nope out of the battle is a subtle detail that stands out as well, too. There's also the whole Radon Festival part. His men knew that it wasn't his fault he was going mad, so they hold the Radon Festival as a way to try and give him an honorable warrior's death. Radon's fucking cool. The Fire Giant looks awesome, but his fight was anything but fun for me, and was a huge part of me wanting to use the rune cheese with the bird. Now, he's not really that tough despite his strong attacks and massive health pool. What makes him a huge pain in the ass is how big he is, and specifically how that affects the camera. His size doesn't let you see what the hell he's doing. Unless you're a mage and attacking from a good distance, you need to get in under him and keep attacking his foot. This makes the camera angle suck for basically the whole fight. Is he going to lift his leg to do a stomp or a big shield drop? Don't know. Can't see. Any tells if he's going to roll to the right and miss me or roll to the left and crush me? Don't know. Can't see. 
Is he using fire magic that's going to slowly turn around and blow me up? Don't know. Can't see. When he lights the ground on fire, there are small spots that don't ignite and let you keep swinging away. Where are they? Don't know. Can't see because the camera is clipping between the scenery, his magic, his legs, and my character. This boss goes against everything that Soulsborne games are supposed to be about. Learning attack patterns and getting better through trial and error. Well, you can't see his goddamn attacks unless you're standing in front of him and at a slight distance. If you're in that spot, you obviously can't damage him because he's too far away, but his attacks are right on top of you. Even if you do back off a little bit to see his attacks, you still need to dodge those massive attacks and get right back underneath of him. I can't think of a slower, more tedious way to fight this boss than hoping to dodge those attacks, getting in one or two swings, then purposely backing off to see what he's doing, wait for another big attack, then rinse and repeat, while also running around to fully avoid and track his magic. If you're a melee build, the best way to fight him is to get in close and hope for some luck in his attacks not hitting you. That kinda sucks when a boss fight isn't determined as much by your actions, but hoping for luck and good RNG on his moves. I don't know if my target lock wasn't working right, or if it's how they designed phase 2, but you can't lock onto his legs now. Fighting this guy head on in phase 2 is a way worse strategy. Should you fight him up front where he can do both melee and fire damage at will? Or, you know, run around back where you have cover. If this wasn't my target lock acting up, then it's a horrible choice by the developers. After I beat him, I saw some people online defending it with the argument of, well, that's not how they wanted you to fight the boss for phase 2, so fight it the way they wanted. Well, that goes against everything the game's supposed to be about. That's purposely taking out an area of the fire giant that makes the most sense to attack. You're supposed to find strategies and ways to beat these bosses, not do the game's job for it and make it harder for no reason other than they want you to attack directly in front of him, where he can hit you way easier. Why wouldn't we want to keep using the same and better strategy for phase 2? That's not fair and balanced like bosses are supposed to be. That's purposely making it unfair and annoying for no reason other than making phase 2 of the boss unfair and annoying. The main issue isn't target lock being taken away though. The main issue is that attacking his foot in phase 2 makes the camera suck again even though the fire giant's now on all fours. Just like phase 1, you can't see shit that he's doing. I'd be more inclined to agree with the fight him how they wanted you to fight him argument if the camera sucked because I wasn't fighting him the way they intended, but the camera already sucks in phase 1 as well. This boss just felt kinda cheap and seemed like From Software broke their own rules a little here. His actual design is awesome, and it seemed like they wanted more of a spectacle over substance. This was probably my least favorite major boss fight of the game, because I felt like I was fighting the game's mechanics and camera more than I was fighting the fire giant. As a whole, the bosses are a lot of fun, but the fire giant also highlights an issue I did sometimes have. Some of these bosses are just too damn big, and I don't understand why they don't just zoom the camera out a little bit for these fights. I've seen the shitty counter-argument to these being, well, you're supposed to be like an ant to these enemies, so that's what it feels like. Again, that's just defending a bad mechanic because you like From Software. Pretty sure every time I try and kill a spider in my house, it can see when I move my arm to smack it. It knows when danger is coming as opposed to me just standing there looking at it. There are plenty of times in Elden Ring when you have no clue a large enemy's attack is coming because you just can't see it. It feels like they don't want you knowing when the attacks are coming as a way of simply making the game tougher through bad mechanics. A lot of people might think this is backwards thinking, because this is a large enemy, but I liked the Elden Beast fight. I realized Bleed wasn't working, so I leveled up the Greatsword and respect into a straight strength build. I was still fat rolling though, and this didn't matter because I could actually see his moves. A lot of fans seem to hate how you have to chase him around and can't use Torrent, but I didn't mind it at all. It resets the camera and gave me a fair chance at dodging his attacks, getting in for hits, and then recovering stamina when I needed. Honestly, it felt a little weird that I didn't struggle with the game's final boss and felt comfortable fighting him from the get-go. For me, that made for an enjoyable fight even if I did have to chase him all around. When he hit me, it's because I mistimed my fat roll or stayed in close for too long and he did that stomach smash thing. I didn't feel like the game was working against me, I felt like I messed up. And that's the beauty of Elden Ring. A hundred hours in, 
I'm still pretty bad at it, but through different playstyles, I had no trouble with the final boss. Radagon gave me a ton of trouble, but the Elden Beast was extremely manageable except for that homing missile energy attack. I'm not going to touch on the story a ton, because I don't think I have a great grasp on it, and so much seems to still be fan theories. Like I said in the beginning though, it's essentially the same story that has been told already in the previous three Souls games, except with different characters struggling for power. I didn't expect something as crazy as a JRPG style plot, but I did expect a little more than what was given. George R. R. Martin was a huge selling point before this game's release. Since then, the author himself has come out and said he really didn't do a whole lot, and the majority of his work was given to them years ago. He gave the blueprint for shaping the lore that From Software turned into Elden Ring. It's not deceptive marketing because Martin did work on the game, but his name being a major focus of the marketing did give a lot of people hope that this would be the first Soulsborne style game that has more of an ongoing story and not just a ton of lore. Now, lore and story are two different things. Lore is pretty much what has already happened and the background, while story is what's going on in the present. There really isn't much of an ongoing story at all. Once you beat the Elden Beast, you choose your ending based on which quests you completed throughout the game and try to make the best choice as you see fit. Now, I'm going to completely contradict myself here because I'm kinda torn on this. I really wanted a little bit more of an in-game story to follow along with, but I actually really like the idea of us as a random Tarnished who has no clue what's going on being tasked with this seemingly impossible to know decision. If we had more of a story, then it kind of lessens this ending for me. Having essentially all lore and nothing in the present time to go off of makes these endings a little cooler in my opinion. I have to give the game credit here because I kind of think I'm leaning towards no in-game story being the better call after I beat it and that's something I could have never imagined myself saying. I'm a sucker for story-driven games, and this really made me appreciate the game a bit more when I was feeling like the endgame was losing steam. These are all very quick, yet very effective endings. Good storytelling doesn't have to be long and drawn out, it just needs to get the point across, and Elden Ring does that. Or at least I think it does. So for this part, let's talk about the endings. I guess this should have a big asterisk next to it because I have absolutely no clue if my take on these endings is correct at all. I'm anticipating being way off, so feel free to correct me if that's the case. The basic ending is akin to an old Nintendo game's ending, where you just get a congratulations, you did it screen, then the credits roll. You see your character sit on the throne, and it's over in a matter of seconds. What I don't understand here though, is what exactly do you rule now as Elden Lord? The two fingers are supposed to be some form of support or physical agent for the Outer God of Order, and they rejected you. So shouldn't that mean that the Outer God of Order rejected you too? Why would they support you after you commit what they see as a cardinal sin by burning the Erd Tree? You being Elden Lord was clearly not their plan if they also sent down the Elden Beast to defeat you, as the Elden Beast was supposed to be the embodiment of the Elden Ring. I get that they chose Queen Merica first, but she kinda caused this whole mess and turned her back on the Outer God that chose her anyway. I guess you could spin it that the Greater Will put all this in your way to test to see if you were fit to become Elden Lord, but this is also called the Age of Fracture and I get the feeling that your victory is somewhat hollow and this means that your reign will constantly be challenged by others looking to do the same thing you just did. This would make more sense because that seems to show that you actually aren't the chosen champion of the Greater Will and Outer God. This was the ending I got because I chose to mend the Elden Ring, since that's what we're told all game our main goal is. It's bleak, but I kinda like that this could be all for nothing. That you aren't some chosen ruler, and instead could be nothing more than a footnote in history until the next challenger comes to take your title. A few of the other endings piggyback off of this premise. Mending it with the Golden Order seems to put more faith in humanity managing the lands between, but who knows if that's the right choice either. Who's to say you know better than a god? With that ending, I'm really not sure if I got it right though, so my interpretation might be significantly wrong, and it doesn't seem all that different than the Age of Fracture ending. If you still mended the Elden Ring, aren't you still kinda working under one of the Outer Gods anyway? I don't know. If you completed Fia's questline, not much changes except that death returns to the lands between. I guess that's a good thing, but that also means that our hero Tarnished can be killed off and usurped pretty easily now. 
Like the other two endings, it seems like this doesn't actually fix any of the problems in the lands between though. It just means that people can die. But I'm also not sure what death really means because I thought we already unlocked death by beating Malekith, but that didn't seem to be the case. If you use the Dung Eater's Rune, then you get the ending that you would expect. Everything sucks, and the curse that he rants about takes over, fulfilling his wish for eternal despair. Knowing these games, there's probably some weird lore that turns this into a good thing, but on the surface, this seems to be the closest thing to a cliche bad ending as we can get. Another that would have to be considered a bad ending would be supporting the Frenzied Flame. According to the wiki, the Frenzied Flame supports the Outer God of Chaos. As a result, the lands between are basically destroyed and overseen by a new outer god. If the lands between are just stuck in this eternal power struggle, maybe some new management isn't a bad thing in the long run, but I feel like this probably isn't the god we want calling the shots. Melina is also not a fan of this move and states that she'll hunt us down and kill us for this action, which I guess keeps the power struggle still going anyway, but now everything sucks. Unless I missed some conversations, Melina seems to be the one character that wants to do what's best, and if she's against it, I get the feeling this isn't the outcome we aspired for. Yep, another bad ending. The last one sees us basically put Ronnie in power and become her partner in this new world, free from the greater will by following the moon and stars. This could be a good thing, but she also describes this as a journey into fear, doubt, and loneliness, which makes it seem like it's taking a bleak turn too. This is probably the closest thing to a good ending as we get. Again, I could be very wrong on how these actually play out, but it seems like there isn't really a cliche good ending here, and I like that a lot. This is a story that doesn't feel like it should have a Lord of the Rings-esque happily ever after montage where we simply roll into eternal prosperity. It just wouldn't fit with the game. It makes sense that a power struggle between both celestial gods and inhabitants of the lands between wouldn't end well with a random tarnished guy taking over and choosing who he wants to rule. There are still much greater forces at play here than us, and this cycle of power isn't ending because we say so. Usually I hate ambiguous endings and feel like it's kind of a cop-out. Like, fuck you, it's your story that you wrote, don't make me end it for you. That's like going to Wendy's and they tell me, well, everything's cooked but you have to put your Baconator together, we don't do that anymore. When I hear people say things are open to interpretation, I usually see them as a lazy way of writers not knowing a good way to finish the story. I didn't get that with Elden Ring. Even though there isn't a canon ending, all of them hold the same ominous tone. You finish the game feeling like everything you did probably doesn't matter a whole lot on the cosmic scale, and that's all the ending that we need for a game like this. It's very simple, but I actually really enjoyed that. I think they got to me a little more than they should have because I kinda hate multiple endings in games. It's usually pretty apparent that one is the canon ending, so why not just stick with that? It, yeah, it gives you something to play and makes your choices feel validated, but that just feels disjointed when you know it's not how the game's supposed to play out. Elden Ring manages to give multiple endings while still being able to reel them back in should they make an Elden Ring 2. Or at least they do if I'm right. If I'm wrong, then, well, scratch that whole last part. In the end, I think Elden Ring has proved that these games just aren't my cup of tea, even though it's certainly another great game in the From Software catalog. It feels really weird to say after putting so much time into the game and this video, but I feel like I've had my fill of it. There were times I was definitely ready to give this that same 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 10 rating that most people have, but I just hit such a wall towards the end that it kinda tainted the experience for me. That doesn't make it a bad game or mean that I didn't like it as a whole, but it's how I felt. I'm someone that has no problem leaving a game behind if I'm just not feeling it, but I did still want to finish Elden Ring, which is something I never wanted to do with any of the Dark Souls games before, and that has to mean something too. Hell, I got my money's worth out of it and more. I've played this more than games I've loved. As I said in the beginning, this is just my personal take on the game, and clearly the majority of people absolutely loved it, and I can understand why though. For anyone who watched my video on The Last of Us 2, there were parts of that game that genuinely had me wondering how people could interpret that as a masterpiece. I felt like we were playing two completely different games at some points. I didn't get that feeling with Elden Ring. 
I liked it. I'd recommend it. I just don't like it as much as everyone else. Anymore, people seem to be all in one way or another on virtually everything. It's either not worth their time or it's the greatest thing in the world until the next greatest thing in the world shows up. I feel like people have forgotten that it's okay to just think something was good. That's me with Elden Ring. I thought it was great at times, but just good when I was done with it, and I don't really have a desire to play it again. Hopefully this video didn't come off too negatively, because I really didn't mean it that way, and rewrote this script like eight times to try and give the game praise while also addressing my issues at the same time. Except for the part about some of the overly obnoxious fanboys or irrational people that hate it for no reason. You guys both kind of suck, and I meant that negatively. Whether you agree or disagree, I do hope you enjoyed the whole video if you watched it though. Do the like, comment, and subscribe stuff if you want. I was able to monetize the channel a couple weeks ago, which is pretty awesome. I'm still a very small channel, but you gotta start somewhere. Truly a thank you to anyone who's watched any of my stuff, cause all I'm trying to do is put my dumb thoughts out there and hope people get some entertainment out of it. I'm trying not to put too many ads on, cause we all hate videos where they pop up every five minutes. I did the beginning and ending ads because almost everything on YouTube has it, so it's kinda status quo. I disabled the stupid rectangle ads that appear at the bottom of the screen because no one in the history of the world has ever clicked on one of those on purpose. They're just in the way. I kept my shorter videos to having two ads while my longer ones have three or four. I think putting an ad break in every 20 minutes or so is pretty reasonable for the long ones. No clue what my next video will be on, but hopefully I'll have another one out kinda soon. Anyway, again, thanks to anyone who's watched, and that's all I've got for this one. See you guys.